Good morning. On behalf of the Center for Social Justice, Research, Teaching, and Service, I would like to welcome you to the Global Social Justice Summer Research Symposium. My name is Jennifer Rosales, and I serve as the Director of Research and Evaluation for the CSJ. We have a great lineup of global research projects today that span the globe from Swaziland and Peru to our own backyard in D.C. Our first panel features research from the Education and Social Justice Fellows. The Education and Social Justice Fellowship was created in 2010 by the Center for Social Justice and the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs. Today, you have the pleasure of hearing about the work these researchers conducted in Sydney, Australia, with Ukraine, and Tetra Zimbi. I will pass the microphone over to Melody Foxelman, Associate Director of the Programs at the Berkeley Center, who will be moderating this panel. She will provide more context for the fellowship and introduce the speakers. They will then speak for 10 minutes each. Following the presentations, Melody will host a roundtable discussion with the panelists and ask audience members to contribute questions. I would like to remind undergrads in the audience that if you're interested in applying for the 2018 Education and Social Justice Fellowship, please pick up a flyer at the registration table. We will have information sessions at 2 p.m. on September 26th and 7 p.m. on October 5th at the CSJ. I would quickly like to thank the Berkeley Center, particularly Melody and Sara Finghall, the CSJ, my fellow staff members, faculty members who have served as advisors and mentors to the panelists, the provost office, and Georgetown's IRD for helping make these significant research trips so productive. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Melody Fox Ahmed. I'm the Associate Director of the Program at the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs. Um, I'll tell you briefly a little bit about the center. We were created within the office of the president in 2006, so we have recently celebrated our 10-year anniversary. We are dedicated to the interdisciplinary study of religion, ethics, and public life through research, teaching, and outreach. Um, two premises guide our work, that a deep examination of faith and values is critical to address global challenges, that the open engagement of religious and cultural traditions with each other can promote peace. So that um, ethos really informs this project, the Education and Social Justice Project that you're about to learn about. Um, I want to thank the Center for Social Justice, Andrea Whistler, Jennifer Gonzalez, um, my colleague Sarah Singa at the Berkeley Center, and all the staff who worked really hard to make this event possible today. Um, I want to thank the audience who made the right choice to be here today. <laughs> student researchers and learning about global social justice work all around the world. Um, I think these sessions will surely give us all ideas that will inspire our own work here on campus and around the world. And I want to thank our student researchers who will be here throughout the day and for our panel right now, Rashida Madhavali, Nicholas Na, Anastasia Sandown, and Mary Green, who we are about to hear from. Um, these students have dedicated the past year to putting their commitment to social justice, um, to, to advancing global social justice to work. They have spent the past year learning research and interview methods, completing the IRB process, which is always very easy, right? Um, researching their host countries, formulating a research plan, and finally, getting on planes and touching down in places most of them have never been before, spending three weeks getting strangers to talk to them, often in foreign languages, about the vital but sensitive issues of how faith and, and, and education intersect to overcome severe challenges of poverty, lack of opportunity, corruption, and more in order to prepare young people as leaders who will improve their communities. These students research the innovative ways that Jesuit educational institutions are providing opportunities for the most marginalized students in the process, listening to the concerns of the community. So that's something unique about, about this project. They weren't just going to any old school in the middle of rural Mozambique. They were actually at a faith-based Jesuit institution. So they conducted interviews with everyone in the community, with teachers, administrators, families, students, um, government officials, religious leaders, and more. Many of these individuals they spoke with never had the chance to have someone say, sit down with me, let's do an interview. Tell me about why you dedicate your lives to education. What is the role that faith plays in inspiring your work? And how do you see your work improving the lives of students in your community and your overall community? 
So something I think that's really important about this project is that it gives prominence to these vital voices of these practitioners that we don't often hear from, but are doing so much of the work of peace building and education around the world. We publish their stories on the Berkeley Center website. Um, we have a really impressive collection of best practices for education and social justice around the world. I really encourage you to read this collection of interviews and reports. We're now in our ninth year of this project, and students have gone to 30 countries. I pulled up the website and found it, and I couldn't believe it, but they've actually been to 30 different countries around the world. This is the website, as you see here. Um, so each student has a project. So here we have Mozambique, here we have Australia, Ukraine, um, Dominican Republic, you can go down and read them all. Um, you can click publications, you can read the past reports, the interviews are here. Um, and it's just, it's really an incredible collection of resources, um, the likes of which I haven't seen anywhere else. So I really encourage you to, to check out the student work. Uh, so now we will hear from our student researchers about their time in Australia, which was Nicholas Na, Ukraine, Anastasia Sendown, and Mozambique, Karshida Nanakali. Our fourth researcher, Mary Green, went to the Dominican Republic, which she's actually brought in South Korea right now. Uh, following the presentations, we will have an opportunity to pose questions to the student researchers and have a discussion. So now it is my pleasure to introduce Nicholas Na. Um, Nick is a student in the Walsh School of Foreign Service, class of 2018, majoring in international political economy with a certificate in international development. Nick found his passion for international education in Clarkston, Georgia, which is, I'm from Georgia too, and it's actually um, a small town known as the Ellis Island of the South because it accepts so many refugees. Um, he worked um, through a refugee tutoring ministry working with children from Afghanistan, Somalia, Eritrea, Bhutan, and Nepal. He also engaged in Navajo community in Mexico in education advocacy. At Georgetown, he's involved with DC schools. Um, and he conducted research in Australia on the challenges and opportunities First Nation students face in elite institutions in the city. So, Nick, it's my pleasure to invite you up to the podium. Well, hi. Um, like uh, Melody said, I'm a current senior mm -hmm. in the School of Foreign Service, and my major is International Political Economy, which I'm now finding out in my last year at school that it's actually a bunch of words for I don't really know what I'm doing with my life. <laughs> so hopefully I don't land on my parents' couch and find a job uh, by the end of the year. Uh, but go seniors. Um, <laughs> so that's me and uh, Cindy, that's Circular Key, it's one of the kind of landmark tourist uh, areas. Uh, and it really was a great privilege uh, that I got to go. It's, it was one of my first times going abroad uh, in my life, and I'm, I'm really thankful to the Berkeley Center and the CSJ for letting me go um, on such a wonderful opportunity. Um, so I, I looked into what, what does social justice mean for Australia? And when we think of the word social justice, it implies an inherent social injustice, right? So before we can, I can even talk about what social justice means for Australia, I, we need to look at the historical context. Um, so what was social justice um, in Australia that necessitates a social justice, right? Um, and the main thing is the stolen generations. So what are the stolen generations? Well, the stolen generations refer to the children of Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander uh, descent who were stolen or forcibly removed by the government um, without parental consent, um, and they, these children were re relocated into predominantly white societies where they were re-educated, or in other words, taught to reject their indigenous values and to adopt um, adopt the uh, adopt white values. So this is incredibly um, not just unjust, but just a horrible thing to think about. I mean, imagine you're a parent and you're coming back to your home only to realize one of your children are just gone. They're, they just they just disappeared and you have no knowledge of where they went um, or how they're doing. And so it's an incredible injustice in that it denies the dignity of First Nations people. Now, it's estimated that around 100,000 children were forced to be removed during the early 1900s. And this still carries ripple effects today. Then in 1986, um, a shift happened, and 
That's when um, Pope John Paul II came to Australia, to Alice Springs, which is in the geographical heartland of Australia, and he gave a landmark address calling Catholic churches um, to strive for reconciliation with the First Nations. Now, how, how you know, reconciliation, that's a big word. What, what does that mean? Well, it's, it's in, in part asking for forgiveness, but it's on another part inviting the First Nations community to into the Catholic community, saying your your value, your cultures matter as much as ours do. Ours do. And so that leads us to back to my research question: How is social justice, in light of the stolen generations, being done through education, uh, particularly Jesuit education? And what I found were three things, three values that were necessary um, for social justice to be being done for, so, for the stolen generations. So the first is restoring dignity. It's affirming the inherent dignity of First Nations people. Second is cultural reclamation. So what I mean by that is um, with each successive generation, um, a lot of the indigenous culture has been lost because institutionally, um, indigenous children were taught to reject their cultures. So it's necessary for First Nations children to relearn their cultures in a way. And the third thing is uh, spiritual healing. Now, if I had a long, you know, two hours over a coffee to like talk to you, like I would definitely go through all three, but I don't have that, so I only have a couple more minutes. So I'm gonna talk about just the first one, which is restoring dignity. Um, how, what I did for my actual research was I conducted interviews. So it was a stratified sample that covered students, faculty, and community. Now, my partner institution was St. Ignatius College, which is a boarding school for boys in years 7 through 12. And at St. Ignatius College, they have something very special, which is the First Nations Unit. So the First Nations Unit, these are just some values that the First Nations Unit has within their program. But put simply, the First Nations unit actively seeks out First Nations students and invites them um, to come to the school. Um, and around six children per year are admitted into the First Nations unit. A hundred percent of their tuition and boarding costs are funded by scholarships. And as of last year, eight students have graduated. And so this eight students in the context of this small boarding school is, is a pretty, it's a fair, uh, fair number. Uh, it's a considerable size, and this number has been growing every year. Um, but here, the main thing about the First Nations Unit is that it's not just an academic program, right? It's it's really about how how do we continue the growing work of social justice for First Nations through the students, right? So the main the main uh, part I'm going to talk about is restoring dignity. And that's really done through the National Sorry Day Assembly. So, National Sorry Day, what is it? It's, it's so in Australia, the federal government um, announced an annual event every year on May 26. Um, the whole country goes through a remembrance of the stolen generations. It's not a celebration. It's it's almost a, it's almost a continual apology, um, and it's also remembering a sobering remembrance of what the country did to the first people of the land. Um, it, at St. Ignatius College, there's a special event on National Sorry Day, um, which is the National Sorry Day Assembly. And what, they, what this assembly does, it, it's led completely by um, the First Nations students, and they lead the entire student body. So everybody is required to attend this, indigenous or non-indigenous students, um, faculty and staff, everybody comes, um, and the First Nations unit uh, leads addresses, ceremonies, and dances. I got the opportunity to actually attend this because May 26 was part of um, the time that I was there, and it was just really special because um, one of the dances that they had was called the platypus dance, um, and the platypus dance is where it, it symbolizes um, it's, it tells the story of a platypus trying to navigate its way in a huge river. And it's a way of the First Nations students expressing, hey, this is what it's like for us to go to a predominantly white institution and um, from predominantly a, a First Nations community, 
right? So that that cultural shock is is expressed through this dance. Um, and so, what? Why is cultural expression so important for social justice? Well, first, it affirms the inherent value of culture for the First Nation students. Because if you think about it, culture is part of one's identity, and especially in light of the stolen generations where their culture was denied, it's even more important that to, expect, to give um, First Nations people the agency to express their culture and to take pride in their culture. The second thing that it does is that it educates. So who is it educating? Well, it's educating the non-Indigenous students. Um, so what is it educating them in? It's educating them in the universal dignity of all people, with the specific focus on indigenous communities. Um, so, a lot of these events, like the National Sorry Day Assembly, are led through, um, led by Caleb Taylor, who is one of the fir few First Nations staff employed by the school. So, Caleb Taylor um, leads the cultural enrichment program. So, there is a specific programmatic insistence that. First Nation students should relearn their cultures and should be given the opportunity to express their cultures. This is huge because it not only teaches First Nation students um, the, the values of First Nations communities, but it teaches the whole school, right, the values of First Nations um, uh, the communities. And so um, the cultural enrichment program holds several activities such as smoking ceremonies, learning dances, or playing the didgeridoo, which I also had the pleasure of playing. Um, it's, it's really a fascinating instrument. Uh, I, I'm an oboist, and, and even that, it, it just, there's a lot of tonal differences. It's just really fantastic. If you ever had the chance, uh, definitely do. Um, so to really close out this presentation, I want to talk about just one last thing, which is continuing justice. And I had an interview with the um, principal of the school, um, Dr. Paul Hine. And he said, one of the quotes that he said was, this is not a project for tomorrow. And I'm not going to read um, this whole quote, but basically the idea that Dr. Paul Hine had was that this idea of social justice for First Nations is something that will last far past his own lifetime. And maybe even the lifetime of his school. It's a, it's a work that, that, you, that continually needs to become more just. Um, and that's, that's something remarkable to think about because doesn't that get at the heart of education itself? Education, it never really ends when your students graduate, right? It, it's, it's really a lifelong process. And I think that ties really well into this Jesuit value of pure personalis. What is pure personalis? In Latin it means care for the whole person. And to really care for the whole person doesn't take just a year, right? It doesn't take just teaching them academically. It takes um, an education of the whole self. It takes um, expressing culture. It takes restoring culture. It, it also takes spiritual healing in a lot of sense. Um, so that's care for the whole person or pure personalities is the main vehicle in which the First Nation student does justice. Thank you so much for your time.
Um, it was really special for me to be able to go to Ukraine because my parents are actually from there. Um, they came to the U.S. in 1993, not long after the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, so getting to be in Ukraine and sort of um, talking to individuals there was really an interesting experience, not just in terms of reconnecting for me and with my roots, but also um, it challenged a lot of um, the things that I thought I knew going into the project. Um, so like Melanie said, um, this summer I was in the Ukraine. Lviv is in the western part of Ukraine. And just to give a little bit of historical context about the country, Ukraine was part of the Soviet Union until 1991, and then as the Soviet Union began collapsing, all of the separate socialist um, republics began voting to uh, leave the Soviet Union. So in 1991, Ukrainians voted on a referendum to leave the Soviet Union. Um, since that time, there have been two really major sort of protest movements in Ukraine that have really marked um, Ukrainian sort of contemporary discourse. So the first was the Orange Revolution in 2004. Um, so that one happened after massive allegations of voter fraud in a presidential election. And then the Yevra Maidan from 2013 to 2014. So a lot of you probably remember this kind of going on in the news and it really brought Ukraine I think, into the eye of the world. Um, but the Yevra Maidan was really, I would say, is going to end up being the catalyst and the defining moment for Ukraine in the 21st century. Um, and this was an experience in which thousands of Ukrainians came out to the streets after the president of Ukraine canceled talks with the European Union leaders, and instead he wanted to move the country more uh, closer to Russia, which a lot of Ukrainians are uh, very much against. Um, after that, uh, we have the Russian invasion of Crimea in March 2014. So uh, after these protests and everything kind of settled down, the Ukrainians put in place a sort of temporary government, a transitional government. And um, at that time, the Russian government moved into Crimea, uh, saying that they were moving in to protect sort of ethnic Russians in the region because they were afraid that um, the new Ukrainian government would be oppressive towards them. Um, however, a lot of people saw this as just a complete um, going against the Ukraine's territorial sovereignty. And Ukraine is currently dealing with a conflict in the eastern part. So there are two regions that really have this conflict. Um, it's very much going on, it's not frozen, it's very much still a hot conflict in those regions. So those are the next and the last. So both of these, um, they're kind of like states, all the state states in Ukraine, um, they both voted to become independent from the country. Uh, and um, they voted to become independent republics. Um, however, given that they are territorially part of Ukraine, this was seen as illegitimate, so now they're technically at war with um, the government of Ukraine. Um, so really thinking about Ukraine today, what we have is a country that's very much trying to grapple with its past in order to really shape its future. Um, and this really isn't easy because there are a lot of different visions in Ukraine for what that future is going to be, and that tends to be very divisive for the people in the country. Um, and Ukraine very much, I would say, is a country that is sort of caught between Europe and Russia, which only complicates the situation further. Um, so given that I was in a very kind of explicitly educational space, I was in one university in Ukraine, um, I ended up hearing a lot about education, and it became very apparent to me what sort of the gaps in education in Ukraine were. And that really drove me to start to research the education system in Ukraine. Um, so a little bit of context about that. Ukraine really has a legacy uh, from the Soviet Union. So the Soviet model very much treated education as um, a tool rather than an end in and of itself. And that really continues to shape how education is seen in Ukraine. Um, right after independence, there were a lot of uh, reforms that were introduced in the country. However, given that all of the administrators who would technically be putting those reforms in place, because they had all been educated, because they would all been working as part of the Soviet Union, they really didn't have the tools to effectively do that. So a lot of the reforms became stalled, and that's kind of where the country is today. More recently, there have been a lot of reforms to admissions and financing, and particularly important for my research was the change in the admissions process. So. Um, Ukrainian, the Ukrainian government introduced this exam, and Ukrainians refer to it as the Zenna Hall or the External Independent Evaluation, and it's kind of like the ACT or the SAT in the U.S., where there is an independent body that administers this exam for all Ukrainian students, and the idea was really to start curbing corruption um, in admissions to universities. And then a final kind of point that's really crucial for understanding the Ukrainian Catholic University specifically is the difference between public and private universities in Ukraine. For the most part, public universities are seen as more prestigious, um, and they have a lot more government oversight, whereas private universities, um, I was told, are generally conceived of as just being someone's pocket. So essentially, they're kind of a front, usually, for a wealthy businessman 
um, to sort of hide his money. Um, and then there's also this case of diploma mills. So a lot of students will sort of pay to enter a private university and then not actually learn anything, but end up essentially buying a diploma at the end of their time there. So the Ukrainian education system really is a system, much like the country, sort of caught between reconciling the past, um, dealing with any conflict in the present, and then looking ahead towards the future. Um, so the two main research questions that I went into this project with were, one, how is social justice defined in Ukraine? And two, what role do notions of social justice play in Ukraine? Um, so this is a picture of the Ukrainian Catholic University. This is their new campus. Um, you can see there is this really lovely church. It's actually still being built. And then these buildings right here are actually part of their um, collegium. So that's like their dorm system, which is also very different for Ukraine. A lot of universities don't have dorms that are this nice. Um, but you can see the mission statement of the university right now here. And um, it really is this university that's very much uses religion as sort of this guiding uh, this guiding mission of what it's doing day to day. Um, and it really is a very future oriented university in the way it conceives of the work that it's doing and um, how it shapes its students. Um, so the Ukrainian, the Ukrainian Catholic University is actually founded very recently. Um, they usually write their date of founding as 2002. However, it does have a much deeper history uh, kind of under different names. And then during the Soviet Union, it was very much kept alive in the, in the diaspora. The idea of such a university was very much kept alive in the diaspora. Um, so in terms of social justice, social justice is not a term that is very much present um, in kind of common discourse in Ukraine. It's a very difficult term for most Ukrainians to define. Um, and it also sometimes can be a little bit of a tricky term, particularly for older Ukrainians, because they really have a fear of bringing up this language that they were growing up when they were growing up in the Soviet Union. Um, for the most part, though, there were three sort of main themes that came out when I talked to individuals about social justice. And these are in no way mutually exclusive, but um, they definitely played into each other. So the first was access. So um, for a lot of Ukrainians, social justice really means being able to access certain resources um, and certain opportunities that they felt like they were being denied. Ukrainians, for the most part, have a very normative understanding of social justice in the sense that they're very much aware of what they should be getting from their society, from their government but they're not getting Another idea that came up a lot was dignity. And I think that this, dignity is a particularly interesting one because I think that that answer wouldn't have come up as much if I were doing this research four or five years ago. Because the Yevra Maidan protests were commonly referred to as um, the revolution of dignity. So dignity really entered into the Ukrainian discourse with that, um, with that, with those protests. Um, and then the other one is self-realization. And that is the idea that all individuals have potential um, and as long as they have the tools that they need to realize that, that potential, they'll be able to do that. Um, so something that I think is really interesting is kind of thinking about um, access and self-realization because a lot of times they kind of play off of each other when I was speaking with individuals. And access really became this way of individuals talking about um, sort of equal opportunity and self-realization became this tool for them to talk about sort of quality of outcomes, which otherwise Ukrainians are kind of very nervous to talk about because, again, it plays on this of Soviet, Soviet rhetoric. Um, so the Ukrainian Catholic University is really, it's considered the best university in Ukraine. So one of the things that it really strives to do is to address these gaps that exist in the Ukrainian edu educational system broadly. So those are corruption, lack of innovation, <coughs> and a um, focus on very theoretical education and a lack of practical education. So. Corruption is probably the number one problem in Ukraine in any sector. When I talked with individuals, they came up when they were talking about healthcare, education, um, dealing with the police, dealing with the justice system, kind of broadly like higher up in the political system. It really is kind of the thing that is on people's minds. Uh, uh, a second problem was lack of innovation. So like I said, the Ukrainian education system is very much stalled. Um, so there really isn't a lot that's going on to sort of adapt to the 21st century. So students are kind of feeling like they're not getting the skills they need for the future. And that also comes up in thinking about practical versus theoretical education. So a lot of students really don't have access to um, things like internships or um, different kind of leadership experiences that would prepare them for the future. So the Ukrainian Catholic University really kind of strives to address these three gaps in making itself the best university. Um, so in the way that it does that, there's really kind of um, two big themes that it, that it plays on. So the first is in dealing with things like corruption, in dealing 
dealing with things like access to um, practical education. It really, the Ukrainian Catholic University provides a lot of opportunities that other universities in Ukraine simply do not or cannot. So it has a lot of um, programs like a summer leadership institute for high school students in Ukraine. It has a summer um, English learning school. Uh, it has a school that is specifically set up for individuals with special needs. So it's really trying to very practically address those gaps. But beyond that, there's kind of these two bigger ways that um, it really, the Green Catholic University really plays out this idea of a socially just school or a socially just university. And that is by modeling just processes for other institutions in Ukraine and also a values-based education. So in terms of just processes, um, Ukraine, the Ukrainian Catholic University markets itself as the only non-corrupt university in Ukraine. So it very much, so it very much um, is very committed to transparency. You can see all of its financial records. You can see all of its sort of admissions processes sort of online, open for anyone to see. And when I talked to, especially administrators, they were really, really passionate about this point because that is something that just doesn't exist in any other kind of area in Ukraine. And they really feel like by doing that, by showing that that is part of their success, that they're able to model that for future institutions in Ukraine. The other is values-based education. So um, the Ukrainian Catholic University was started in the tradition of Catholicism <coughs> and Eastern Christianity, um, and that is really what guides them um, in kind of the way that students interact with each other, the way that professors interact with students, um, and kind of how the university is shaped from the bottom up and also top down. So in terms of just kind of to revisit the research questions, um, on answering the question of how social justice defined in Ukraine, there's really three sort of main themes, which were access, dignity, and self-realization. And then in terms of thinking of what role the notions of social justice play in Ukraine's education system, um, the idea is really that there is a potential for education and for institutions of education to shape progress towards a more just society in Ukraine by modeling those processes. So in terms of implications for the future, um, there really is a lot of potential for young people to shape both the social and the future in Ukraine. There's um, a very common thing that people talk about is the generation that grew up in independent Ukraine. So meaning people that were born after the Soviet Union had already fell apart. So these individuals were very much um, seen as Ukraine's future, and if they're being educated at places like the Ukrainian Catholic University, they really have this potential um, to shape the country into what they want it to be. There's also, um, the Ukrainian Catholic University will be able to encourage a lot of dialogue to really overcome divisions that exist in Ukraine between East and West. Um, and there's also this potential for them to really integrate with the world. Um, and something that, I think just to kind of close out, something that one of the people that I was interviewing said was that um, Ukraine really has this, it's in this place where it can become sort of an amazing success story. It's a country that's at war, famine, um, oppression from a major, a different major power. It has war even now in the 21st century. But if it's able to overcome all of that, it really has the potential to be this incredible success story in history. yourself in this context of education and social justice in a different way, go deeper and really reach your own conclusions about how to make you a success story, which I think will um, really provide help for future research. Um, so thank you for that. Um, now it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Archie Khan Pauli, is an undergraduate student in the Walsh School of Work Service. She is also a senior, class of 2018. She's majoring in international politics with a concentration in international security, and she's doing a certificate in religion, ethics, and world affairs. She's originally from San Diego, and she has been deeply involved with the Center for Social Justice, um, also with the Berkeley Center, where she was a research assistant. Um, last, or during spring semester, she was um, in Lisbon at the Universidade de Nova de Lisboa, and um, in Portugal. Um, and she was a blogger for the Junior Year Abroad Network Program, which is another Berkeley Center program. Um, luckily, she learned Portuguese in Lisbon because then she went to Mozambique that summer to conduct her research um, for the Education and Social Justice Project, where she was at a rural Jesuit high school, um, the St. Ignatius Loyola High School. And this was actually very rural. Um, Andrew and I were talking about this. Um, so she had to take small planes to get out there. Um, I think two of the other researchers we heard from 
kind of that more root urban environments, but her TikTok was really in the middle of nowhere, or we can reach her on the internet. Um, it's been a really interesting experience, so I'd love to invite you up. My name is Harshita. I'm a senior in the SSS, and I traveled to Tetum <coughs> um, to research education and social justice at St. Ignatius Little High School. Um, so, first, I just want to give a little bit of historical context about Mozambique and the location I was in and how education plays into both of those. So, um, Mozambique was one of the last African countries to achieve independence um, after its colonial war from 1964 to 1975. And during this time, Portuguese was made the official language, so since then, all the whole education system that there has been, this is all conducted in Portuguese. Um, also during this time, there were some desert schools, but they were taken over by the government and made into executive government schools. And um, there was also a lot of repression of education of the indigenous Mozambican people. They were usually not allowed to study past the fourth grade um, as a method of keeping them subjugated. So this really created this whole generation of people that were left out of the education um, process. Um, and so right after the colonial war ended, the country then went into a 16-year civil war um, between the ruling party for Limo and the opposing party Renamo. This was a really horrible time with a lot of violence. Um, entire villages were just completely <coughs> burned down, um, especially in the rural areas. And in the rural areas, um, there was a lot of migration to Malawi, Zambia, Zimbabwe. Um, people, many of the people I spoke with still have families there. Um, so even if they did receive an education as refugees in those countries, it was not in Portuguese. So when they came back, um, everything was being connected to Portuguese, they were still kind of behind. Uh, it also created a really big rural-urban divide um, in the educational process, which still exists to, to this day um, in terms of opportunities and access to resources. Um, so to give you an idea of where I was in this map, um, you can see Tete on the map, and I was like a <coughs> It's really close to Malawi. I was able to see into Malawi actually on my drive from the airport. Um, and the capital is much farther down. It's not even on the map. Um, so, ACL, which is St. Ignatius Loyola High School, it's known as a community school. So, it's run by the Jesuits, administered by the Jesuits, and it's like run on Jesuit values um, you know, the rigor, the discipline, lack of corruption. Um, but it actually does use the national Mozambican curriculum, and it's also the, sal the salaries of the teachers and administrators are paid by the government, and um, so there is like this degree of collaboration, which is important in implementing it into the greater um, national national education system. Right now, there's about 600 students there. It's great. It's only in its second year, so it's a very new school. They're still figuring it out, a lot of stuff out. Um, out. So. It's interesting to see their ideas about innovating um, the school to be a leader in the region um, in rural education. Um, they also, one really important component is that they have a boarding school. Right now they house about 300 students. And this is really important because having a boarding school gives them this ability to kind of integrate this idea of care personalities and have extracurricular activities and, um, you know, allow the students to engage in sports and get extra support. Um, and, yeah. So, also, one really important thing is that everybody mentioned that the thing that they love most about ACL is that there's no corruption because, like in Ukraine, um, especially the education system is just completely ridden with corruption. Um, basically, students pay off the teachers to get through every class, and they can arrive in eighth or ninth grade as many of the students do at ACL, and they just can't speak in Portuguese at all. And considering all the classes are taught in Portuguese, it's ridiculous. I mean, how are they going to learn math or science or anything else if they can't understand the language instruction? So. Um, that's a really big component of this. Um, so for my research methods, I also conducted interviews because I was so isolated. I was limited to students, teachers, administrators, and volunteers at the school. Um, I also, because I didn't really have much contact with the school beforehand, I went in with a very general approach. Um, I was asking questions about education and social justice generally, the challenges they face, the successes they've had, um, the experiences people have had past educational uh, institutions that they've been at. Um, and through that, I was able to find like three emerging issues and formulate a thesis. So because that's the process I went through, um, I'll kind of take you through it the same way and first present those three issues and then my thesis at the end. Um, yeah, and as Melody mentioned, I did do all three in Portuguese and then translate it and transfer into them. Um, so, so the first issue that emerged was language learning parallel to cultural expression. Um, so. This is the 
Chichewa Nation issue because most of the people in this region, this rural area, are from the Chichewa ethnic group and they speak Chichewa, which might also be referred to as Nyanja in some of the quotes as a dialect. Um, but they really do struggle with Portuguese because it's not reinforced in their homes at all. Um, after outside of class, you know, with their families, their friends, they don't really speak Portuguese at all. Um, but it's really a critical gateway because if they want to move on to university or city jobs, everything is connected in Portuguese. So without this, you know, they're not able to have the same degree of representation as urban students who have better uh, like exposure to Portuguese. Uh, and they're really not able to go on outside of Tete and communicate with anyone from other parts of the country, essentially. Um, so because of this, they still does really try to reinforce this. They have extra tutoring classes. Um, I think they had some Portuguese volunteers who came and were really helping with that. Um, they are trying to actually try to restructure their whole class schedule right now. At the moment, because of the lack of resources, half the students learn in the morning, and then half the students take their classes in the afternoon. And right now, they're trying to open a new wing of classrooms so that everybody can learn in the morning, bring up the afternoon for either extracurricular activities, sports, arts, cultural classes, um, or extra Portuguese classes to reinforce that for students who need it. Um, so that's really important. And then also at the same time, though, because of this repression of uh, the <coughs> language and also many other local languages for so long, um, because the school is founded on this mission of social justice, it's really important for them to allow the students to also express, it, express their own culture. And although they're not able to teach in that, um, you know, they've toyed with the idea of bilingual education, which comes with its own challenges because not all the students from the area all come from the same ethnic group. So they don't all speak the same language. The teachers don't all speak the same language. Um, they're kind of trying to incorporate in the future teacher about classes um, in the language, but also like how can they apply that to literature and, um, you know, it's not really as much of a written language, so to build that for future generations and have these learning materials in teacher about they're hoping to do that in the future classes. Um, they also incorporate teacher about into extracurricular activities at some other schools. Um, students told me that if they are heard even speaking their local language, if even outside of class, they're punished and, you know, they're in bathrooms or something. Um, so if they don't do that at all, they encourage it outside the class. Um, they had a talent show series when I was there, so they had to show dances and songs, and then also among um, Portuguese and English dances and songs. Um, also, the, the priest, um, Father Muller, who's there, he's a German priest in the last year, but he has taken a lot of efforts to learn Chichewa and even present some of the maps and that and allows them to sing um, their songs in Chichewa. So it's really this encouragement of while you're while we're supporting you in learning Portuguese to give you this ability to move forward if you want. Um, we're also going to, um, at the same time, allow you to express your culture. Um, and then the second main issue that emerged was an agricultural component. Um, that's a really important dimension of the school. Many of you were familiar with Pope Francis's doctrines on environmental justice. Um, this is actually cited in the founding documents of the school. I was able to read all the founding documents of the school, the correspondence between the um, the, the Jesuit delegations in Zimbabwe, Mozambique, and the school as they were founding this charter. Um, so it, they have an agriculture class that's mandatory for all students, and they teach them innovative technologies, seeding techniques, um, to give them this ability that if they choose to pursue agriculture, because the reality is that many of them will not go on to university or jobs, they are empowered in the same exact way that the students are who want to go on to university or jobs um, to help their families. And it also really instills a value of dignity and honor in agricultural work, which is sometimes, I think, educational um, organizations and not as emphasized. Um, and yeah, it's really important for the region because pretty much all there is there is agricultural work. There's not really any government institutions, universities in that area. So um, in terms of community empowerment, that's very important. And lastly, the third issue that emerged is community engagement. Um, there's another Jesuit mission in the area called Sateva, and that's for adults. They have agricultural workshops, they have farming jobs for many of them, and it kind of creates this intergenerational engagement because many of the families, um, adults, parents in those communities go to Sateva to get agricultural workshops and learn. That's <coughs> so it builds this really good goodwill network, and there's a really good receptive <coughs> school um, because some of the adults are already familiar um, with the Jesuit mission, Jesuit educational mission. Um, they also invite local chiefs to all the activities they have, um, talent shows, they invite them to speak, for example, the Independence Day, I was lucky enough to be there on the moment of Independence Day also. Um, they also give a lot of jobs for locals, There's, the school has a lot of farmland, so they 
maintain that. Um, right now they're still building a lot of it. They also buy a lot of their produce um, there for the meals and the burning house and the house. So that's how they kind of engage with their community. And my thesis kind of then emerged from these three issues was that ACL empowers students and the surrounding community within these existing local structures um, in three avenues of reinforcement. So the first is extra Portuguese support without coming at the expense of indigenous culture or language. The second is a formal agricultural education. And the third is community engagement to expand the sphere of influence and the social justice mission beyond just the students itself. Um, so that's it for now, and I think Nick Anastasia and I are happy to take questions. Thank you, Thank you for that really fascinating look at um, this really um, innovative school in rural Mozambique that I think we're all really happy to have learned about the work. Um, now, I'd love to invite our three panelists up to join me here for some questions. I will ask one very quick question of the panelists and I'll open it up. So I noticed a lot of really um, fascinating overlap in the themes that you all were discussing. Um, could you each share something that really resonated with you from your colleague's presentation? Um, could be something that you noticed in your own work that inspired you to continue your own social justice work? Um, just love to hear if you had an idea that resonated with your colleague's presentation. Yeah, I think, um, Nick, your idea of like this cultural empowerment of the first Asian students was very similar to what I was seeing in the work of why that's important and, you know, trying to repair the standards that's been done, um, even if it wasn't necessarily done in my case by a people. people. Um, that is what we're saying. And it's something that's seen in all around the world, so um, seeing that concretely and how so in certain institutions, there are some institutions that are trying to repair that damage. Um, it's really fascinating how they use different methods to do that um, and incorporate it into education. Um, so it's not a separate process. But. Um, yeah, I, you know, something that really <laughs> stood out to me from all the presentations was the word dignity. Um, and, you know, in different contexts, it could mean different things, but I wonder why. Uh, in this work of social justice, that where dignity holds so much weight, so much uh, gravity. And I think it's in part from a Jesuit idea. The idea of dignity means that each person has a God-given value, right? They, it, there's an inherent value to just being a person. Um, and yeah, in all of these circumstances, um, with Jesuit or Catholic institutions, um, these institutions are really trying to care for the dignity of a person that um, may oftentimes have been lost. And, um, yeah, I think that's something really remarkable um, from all our projects. Um, so I think that something that was really interesting for me is kind of thinking about how education really is um, kind of this moving, changing thing all the time, but at the same time, it is very much a product of a country's history whether that be a history of um, sort of more negative, you know, things like oppression or war, or it's more of a sort of positive kind of looking towards the future. But I think it's really interesting how I think all three of us sort of um, started with that understanding, the, ne the necessity of understanding the context of the countries and the communities in which we were in order to really even begin to understand um, how education, what education looks like in those spaces. And I think that that just really speaks to um, kind of uh, this idea that you really need to engage a person kind of combining both your answers. I think you really need to engage an individual sort of um, in terms of where they were and where they want to be if you want to educate that individual. So I think that all three of us really kind of was kind of in there in our research. Great, thank you. I would like to open it up. Who has a question for the panelists? If you could stand up and introduce yourself.
Hi, I'm Julia Thomas. Um, all of you guys' presentations were fantastic, and I really um, applaud all three of you guys for, for sharing your experiences and for even taking the step to go and do these very these <coughs> old experiments. So my question is, as um, students in America, um, going to these very different places, were you challenged, were any of your core beliefs or core feelings about um, social justice issues that you were researching challenged? Um, and if so, how did you deal with that, with the need to be a biased researcher and as a human who comes from your own culture um, and has your own beliefs? I'm really curious about that. Thank you. Um, so I would actually love uh, to start on that question because I think something that I was not expecting when I was going to Ukraine because I was going to a country where literally most of my family still lives, where um, I speak the language, I'm familiar with the culture. I was not expecting to, to have any of those beliefs really challenged. I was kind of expecting more for them to be sort of even further cemented. Um, so I think being in Ukraine was really interesting for me because I realized um, how much of what I was hearing or how much of what I thought I knew about Ukraine was coming from a very kind of um, singular point. It was coming from a very sort of narrow perspective of what people in the diaspora thought Ukraine should be. And something that was actually challenged for me um, in Ukraine was kind of learning to, to think about half of the population that is Russian-speaking, half of the population that does not totally buy into this idea of European integration and in the U.S., those people are seen as not being Ukrainian enough. And being in Ukraine was really interesting because it made me think about how are their, it made me think about the validity of their experiences. And I realized that by denying those experiences, that I was denying half of the country's experience of what it meant to be Ukrainian. So I think something for me, in terms of kind of a broader vision of social justice, was um, sort of learning to get away from what I thought they should be saying. I think I had this idea of what I was going to get out of my research before I even went. So um, for me, this idea, where I really grew in my understanding of social justice was really kind of checking any preconceived notions and going into it, um, allowing people to fully share their experiences and really listening to those experiences before making um, a judgment about them. Um. Um, yeah, you know, I was kind of surprised, but at the same time I wasn't. Um, there were things that were challenging but I would say for the most part, what was most challenging, or the most uh, the thing I learned the most, was that most of the things were pretty much the same. So um, here's what I mean by that: um, the patterns of oppression that I, you know, that I grew up with, that I learned about here in the U.S. So for us, it's in, historically it's mostly you know slavery and racial, you know, racial justice issues. Uh, those were pretty much the same in terms of different analogs in Australia. Uh, and, but I think another thing that I was surprised by were it wasn't just the patterns of oppression that were similar across the board, but it was also the patterns of resilience. So, um, you know, best practices for building resilience within communities. Uh, the idea the you know, like going back to that social justice idea of, of um, affirming a person's dignity, right? Um, those things really remain the same across the board. Um, and that's what I thought was, I, I, on one hand, like surprising, because I thought, oh, like maybe it'd, it'd be, you know, social justice will be completely different in a, you know, in a different context. But um, what I found actually was that it's really the same um, across the board, at least in, in my research. I think for I think for me, what I found that was really interesting is just, I think we all ask this question of what does social justice mean to you for the people? And I think for, you know, we all have these ideas, our own ideas of what social justice is. And when I went there, like, I kind of had an idea of what I thought their idea of social justice would be. And I just heard this, like, really broad range of responses, like, you know, from students just having basic school supplies, which you wouldn't immediately think of as, like, the broad, like, if I asked how do you define social justice, you know, that's not the first thing that would come to my mind. And then, for others, um, it was like having the ability to speak their language and do these things. So just the really broad range of answers I got about social justice was really interesting and reminded me like in any organization that's trying to do social justice work, it's, you know, you're not just serving one person, but there's these like different things that everybody wants. So it's, it's like, how do, you, how do you serve all of these social justice needs and ideas of what they want? Um, 
innovation of an organization that's trying to do that, whether it's a school or NGO or whatever that might be, which was really, yeah, that was something I didn't really consider before. Thanks. Okay, so yeah, I think that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey everyone, my name is Caleb Morrell. I'm a graduate from 2016. I actually did the Berkeley Center Religion Ethics World Affairs Certificate Program, so it's good to be back. And uh, I had a question for Nick specifically. I was really intrigued by this idea of the National Sorrow Day in Australia. I don't think I've ever heard of such a thing. You know, I'm used to countries celebrating good things they've done, but I don't think we're quite as used to uh, countries having a National Day of Mourning to commemorate bad things they've done. And it made me think about our own American experience. And I wonder, Nick, um, you're experiencing that in Australia. Do you see ways where that could be helpful here in America? Um, are there, is there, do you think that's a possibility? Do you, how do you think that could help America or other countries to do something similar? Thanks. Yeah, um, so I, so over the summer, I actually did um, a compilation of blogs, um, just kind of where I reflected about my experience. And I, I made a blog, blog especially about this event um, because isn't that just so profound? A country dedicates a day, you know, out of 365, you know, to to say sorry, and it's called National Sorry Day. Um, and you know, the first part of reconciliation is admitting that you've done something wrong, right? And the second part is is you know saying sorry, and you know, for America, like. I, I can't even think of one day where maybe for a, you know for Columbus Day they I think they renamed it like, a, like Indigenous Heritage Day or something like that but it's not even it's it's portrayed as a celebration right uh, of Indigenous culture which is necessary I think but before you can celebrate something I think you really need to also acknowledge. Why hasn't it been celebrated in the past? Well, it's because there's been a social injustice done on um, the indigenous people of our land as well. Um, and so, yes, I, I think, um, to answer your question, Caleb, like, there, it's almost to me, it seems to me necessary for this country to admit its faults um, with groups that have been oppressed before we can even move forward in um, in social justice for these groups. Um, and it doesn't just take a Black History Month, it doesn't just take an Indigenous Heritage Day, it takes um, a day, or more than just one day, of, of, of the whole country saying sorry to these oppressed people groups. Hi, my name is Jessica Lee, a DC Schools Project Program Director at the CSJ. Um, so this might require a little bit of vulnerability on your parts, uh, but my really driving curiosity is, so when we tend to do research, we tend to do it from a very objective perspective, yes. We bring in our personal biases, but at the same time, I think um, my kind of curiosity for you all is taking what you've learned there, um, how do you see yourselves, th thinking about this question of how do I become a more just person, um, what does it mean for you from what you've learned from your research to apply that moving forward and in terms of your roles moving forward within this work of social justice? Um, so for me, I think being in a space where um, social justice was not really a term that anyone was familiar with. People were very much um, even hesitant to use the word social justice and I think that that's not just the case for Ukraine. I think there are plenty of places, even here in the U.S., where plenty of people get skittish when they hear the term social justice because to them, um, their understanding of it is something that they see as a negative. Um, so I think being in Ukraine and sort of having to engage with people, um, and I was doing interviews, but oftentimes after the interviews where I would kind of take in all this information, I would get to talk with the person I was interviewing, and we would really talk about um, where that definition came from and kind of had more of a chance to explore it with them. So I think that in those conversations of kind of that exploration, um, it was interesting for me because I felt like I was facilitating more than just the interview, but I was facilitating kind of the start of dialogue. And I feel like um, in some ways having that, for a lot of people I think that was the first time that they were really hearing the term social justice. So 
in my mind, I'm hoping that that is something that they then continue to think about even once I had left Ukraine. So I think for me, this experience really um, gave me um, a very unique way of engaging with people who have not heard about social justice or who do not think that it is something that is um, applicable in their lives. And um, it really taught me kind of how to take someone's context and sort of find spaces where I can engage with them, um, which I think I had a decent understanding of how to do that before. But this was just a completely different context in which to do that. So um, I think that was a really, really beneficial experience for me. Yeah, um, I, I kind of also want to bounce off of what Anastasia said earlier about um, her having to challenge her preconceived notions, right? Um, and, and something I realized um, over my research was that this world is profoundly broken. I mean, any country you go to, there will be some injustice done on some person, right? And, um, and I think it's, it's important for me to know where do I fit in into that, right? Like, where, where is my position, my place in that? And, um, and Jessica, your question was, you know, how, how do I think about becoming a more just person or, or continuing justice? Um, and there's this, there's this rapper I really like. His name is The Cray. Um, and he talks, there's a song where he talks about racial justice. And he says, it's, it's not just a field trip. And it's not just going to last for more than one day. Um, and and it's just, I think it's just this idea of I con continually have to reform and, and think about and, and, and reflect on my own values of what justice is. And, and in doing so, enlarge kind of my heart in, um, in understanding people, in affirming people, in, um, and also seeing that brokenness and how, how do I want to respond to that? Um, and so I think it's, it's really just a process of, you know, like, till the day I die, I really want to both acknowledge the brokenness of the world, but also continually more and more affirm the dignity of people. Yeah, I think for me, one thing that was really important is just the method itself of interviews, like, really reinforces this idea that the first step in any justice process is listening. And I mean, like all of our research, you know, even if we came back and researched just theories or ideas of how to put those back into what we learned, that first step was listening and understanding what is missing in the justice process to be with. So I think that's something that I took from it and really can be applicable to any field or any work that people do to first, you know, listen to people and especially around the world, you know, some people are not in the ways that heard. So I think that's what I took was from it to take forward. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much to our researchers, Harshika and Nick and Anastasia. Um, you did an incredible job. Um, and thank you to the audience for your attention, for your questions. Um, students, if you're interested in the ESJ fellowships, pick up one of these fabulous green, bright flyers. It has everything you need to know. There are information sessions. You can contact me or any of our CSJ colleagues to learn more. We look forward to your applications and to the next panel. So thank you all.